Chapter Ten of Nelly Channel. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Brandon. Nelly Channel by Sarah Doudney. Chapter Ten. The Story of the One Dark Hour. Rhoda tried hard to conceal her loss now that the treasure was gone she double locked the casket no one she resolved should know how poor she was so well did she play her part that those around her thought her sterner and harder that was all her manner to ralph changed visibly she began to avoid his company their familiar conversations were at an end her whole energy was now devoted to one endeavour to keep him in ignorance of that which he had won if she were poor he should be none the richer and thus poor soul she went about her daily duties putting on a hard face to hide her weakness even nelly found that rhoda was not so pleasant as she used to be and the child turned more and more to mr channel was he gaining her too i am losing everything and he is getting everything said rhoda to herself perhaps this is god's way of showing me how small my strength is haven't i lost the very thing that i thought myself best able to keep it will always be so with those whom the lord teaches in one way or another the humbling process must be gone through sometimes it is seen of all men sometimes it is known to him alone but as certainly as he loves us shall the nail that is fastened in the sure place be removed and be cut down and fall and the burden that was upon it shall be cut off for the lord hath spoken it in the soul that he makes his own he will not leave a single peg to hang self-confidence upon and when our chamber walls are bare and the tawdry rags of self-esteem are swept out he will enter and fill the room with sweetness one afternoon in the golden harvest time rhoda and nelly sauntered up into the wheat fields the reapers were resting under the hedges in the largest field nearly all the corn had been gathered into sheaves rhoda tired quickly now for when the heart is heavy the limbs are apt to be weary she stopped in the middle of the field and dropped down to rest leaning her back against a great russet shock a few stray ears nodded overhead and nelly nestled under their shadow she had always been an impulsive child one of those children who will ask any question that comes into their heads and a good many come she had no notion of restraining her curiosity if anything puzzled her she must always have it explained rhoda she said suddenly in her clear little voice what has mr channel done to offend you don't you like him the words struck rhoda like a sharp unexpected blow without a moment's pause she cried out harshly and bitterly i wish he'd never come here nelly i wish you and i had never seen him nelly was so startled by the passionate tone that she jumped up from her seat as she moved somebody on the other side of the shock moved also it was mr channel rhoda turned her head in time to see him walking away in an instant she realized that he had heard all but she dared not think of the construction that would be put upon her outburst perhaps she had mortally offended her father's best friend perhaps he would go away from them all for ever oh what a wretched woman i am she groaned aloud and then she saw that nelly had run off after ralph channel she rose slowly and wandered back again to the cottage the doors and windows were set wide open her mother sat peacefully knitting in the parlor but rhoda went straight upstairs to her own room nobody could do her any good just then she wanted to be alone and get her senses together her head ached 
and she had a dazed helpless feeling of having cut herself off from everything comforting so she sat down for a few minutes by the bedside then got up and fell suddenly on her knees in her prayer she did not get much beyond telling god that she was miserable it was rather an outpouring of sorrow than a plea for help but it was her first heartfelt confession of utter weakness and perhaps that was the best way of asking for strength the stray sheep that falls helpless at the shepherd's feet is sure to be folded in his arms and carried in his bosom she could not go down and sit at the tea-table as usual and no one came to disturb her in her solitude but at last when the shadows were lengthening over the fields and the distant church clock struck six she heard a footstep on the stairs the door opened softly and her mother's face looked in may i come to you rhoda she asked gently yes mother rhoda answered i know how shocked and hurt you must be she added but indeed i couldn't help it oh rhoda said mrs farren we've all thought you seemed stern and strange lately but we didn't know until to-day that you had found out our secret he says that it has been all wrong from the beginning he thinks you ought to have heard the truth at once the truth mother echoed rhoda what is it that you mean he says dear rhoda that he ought to have told you who he was mrs farren replied he sees now that it was wrong to come here under a new name a new name her daughter repeated for pity's sake mother speak plainly who is he if he is not ralph channel we all thought you must have found out said mrs farren in a perplexed tone he is poor helen's husband robert claris it was not until some minutes had passed away that rhoda was calm enough to hear her mother's story the two sat hand in hand nearer to each other in heart than they had ever been before perhaps mrs farren had always been a little afraid of her daughter but now that she had got a glimpse into rhoda's inner self the reserve vanished we had always felt sure that robert was no practised sinner she began but we did not know what it was that had driven him to a crime we only guessed something like the truth oh rhoda it's an awful thing when vanity gets the upper hand with a woman poor helen made a sad confession to me when she lay dying in this very room it's hard to speak of the faults of the dead but there's justice to be done to the living whatever her faults may have been they were no worse than mine rhoda said humbly and she has done with sinning now while i shall be going on perhaps for years longer helen got deeply into debt mrs farren continued and she used i'm afraid to go to balls and theatres without her husband's knowledge he was sent away sometimes on business by mr elton but don't think her worse than she was rhoda she loved gaiety and admiration passionately but she wasn't a bad woman at heart he always knew and believed that yet she got him into terrible difficulties poor child and at last when her debts had amounted to three hundred pounds she flung herself at his feet and confessed the truth both the women were crying it was indeed hard to expose the faults and follies of the dead they felt as if they had been tearing the soft turf and sweet flowers from helen's grave and yet it had to be done robert was not a converted man at that time went on mrs farren the blow knocked him down and utterly bewildered him he saw no means at all of paying the debts and he knew they must be paid immediately helen hadn't confessed till her creditors had driven her to extremities and he went into the city in a state of despair for there was no help for him and his god perhaps he would have asked aid from his employer if mr elton had been the owner of the business but old mrs elton was a close woman and her son did nothing 
without her consent rhoda could almost guess what was coming she could see now that man's extremity is often the devil's opportunity if a soul does not seek help from god the prince of darkness steps in on that very morning said mrs farren he found a note from mr elton waiting for him in the office his master told him that he had been suddenly called off to ireland to look after some property there he should be absent six weeks perhaps longer claris was to take his place and manage things as he always did while mr elton was away and just an hour or two later a sunburnt sailor-like man came in and clapped robert on the shoulder robert poor fellow didn't recollect him at first but when he said that he was frank ridley and that he had come to pay a debt of long standing he remembered all about him oh mother why did he come just then sighed rhoda the lord suffered it to be so mrs farren answered christ's hour was not yet come that was the devil's hour and a dark hour it was she went on with the story in her own straightforward way frank ridley and mr elton had been schoolfellows and dear friends but while elton was steady and painstaking even in boyhood frank was a never-do-well one chance after another slipped through his fingers situations were got and lost at last some new opening offered itself but money was needed and frank was at that time almost penniless he came to elton in his strait and asked for the loan of three hundred pounds to everybody's surprise mrs elton lent him the sum she had a liking for handsome young ridley and opened her purse with a good grace for his sake but frank's undertaking was as usual a dead failure and the money was hopelessly lost ridley himself was lost too for eight years he was neither seen nor heard of and then he turned up again in elton's office with a pocket-book stuffed with banknotes i found out my vocation at last he shouted in his hearty tones i'm captain of a trading vessel and i've traded on my account to good purpose here's the three hundred and i'm downright sorry that i must be off again without seeing your governor claris robert received the money all in notes and gave a receipt and then the sailor went his way after that the enemy came in like a flood and the deep waters rushed over robert's soul he did not cry lord save or i perish alas he thought of everything rather than of him who is able to save to the uttermost here was the exact sum that was needed frank ridley was off on his voyages again and would never perhaps return robert had only to put the notes in his pocket and make no entry in the ledger of course there was a certain risk in doing this but it was very unlikely that anything would be found out and here was the sum the very sum that was wanted within his grasp he would pay it all back he would work night and day to do that he caught at that honest resolution and clung to it as a man clings to a frail spar when the ship goes to pieces this was apollyon's hour of triumph robert went out and paid helen's bills on that very night but the burden that he had taken up was far heavier than that which he had thrown off it was on a monday morning that he had received ridley's money and the succeeding days dragged on as if each day were weighted with iron fetters till saturday came robert wrote to his master daily entering into all the details of business as minutely as usual then on the sunday morning that last sunday that he ever spent with helen 
he went upstairs after breakfast and laid down upon his bed the sense of sin and shame was upon him he would not mock god by going to church and looking like a respectable man his wife did not know what ailed him he had told her that the debts were paid that was all monday came again the anniversary of his sin and there on the office desk lay a letter addressed to himself in his master's handwriting it had been written on saturday and was dated from dublin i find i am at liberty to come home at once mr elton wrote i have found a friend here who will look after the property for me strangely enough i ran against frank ridley yesterday and could scarcely believe my own eyes he had come to dublin in quest of an old sweetheart he told me that he had called at the office and had paid his old debt he showed me your receipt when i looked incredulous i am rather surprised that you did not mention this in your letters robert claris put on his hat and coat and went quietly into the outer office blake he said calling the eldest of the underclerks i am not well and must go home at once i leave the keys in your charge for i know you may be trusted blake an honest fellow looked into claris's face and saw that he spoke the truth then followed the most miserable interview with helen and the hurried preparations for flight his wife entreated that she might go away to her old home under her uncle's roof she had brought him nothing but trouble she owned piteously and he would get on better without her alas poor helen a sorry helpmeet she had been to the man who had loved her these two had not asked the lord to their marriage feast and had never drunk of the wine of his love and so they parted never to meet again till they should meet at the marriage supper of the lamb in melbourne there was one ralph channel who had been the friend of robert's father and the miserable man found him out he told mr channel his whole story nothing was concealed the sin in all its hideousness was exposed to ralph channel's sight and yet he took the sinner to his heart but he tested the young man patiently he let him scrape and save to pay back the money that he had stolen he would not give him a single farthing every shilling of the restored sum was fairly earned in mr channel's service and paid out of a small salary and all that time he saw that a mighty work of grace was going on in robert's soul when mr channel lay dying a lonely childless man he called robert to his side all my property is yours he said you are my sole heir and you must take my name ay and you must make it loved and honoured in the old country so robert came to england full of yearnings for the child whom he had never seen from john farren he learnt that rhoda's heart was hardened against him and yet how could he help loving her for the love that she bare to nelly he knew all about rhoda from her mother's letters and he wanted more than he ever acknowledged to see this woman who could be so hard and yet so tender the opportunity came he bought the farm and gave it to the farmer farren only stipulating that it should go to rhoda at her father's death and he came to dwell amongst the farrens as ralph channel this was all that the mother had to tell rhoda got up when the tale was ended and went quietly out of the house the sun had just gone down but there was light in the west where rosy cloud islands floated in a golden sea and there was a light in rhoda's face that gave her a new charm she knew by some subtle instinct where she should find robert channel 
she ascended the steep winding lane that led to the old churchyard how did she guess that one woman's harshness would send him to the grave of another how is it that women go straight to a conclusion which a man could only reach by a circuitous route he never saw nor heard her coming his head was bent over that flowery mound and the grass deadened the sound of her feet she had been very brave until she found herself by his side and then all her strength and courage suddenly fled she had no words to plead for forgiveness she could only touch his arm with her trembling hand and call him by the name that she had hated all these years robert there was very little said just then the last glow was dying out of the skies and the dews were falling on helen's grave but the lord lifted up the light of his countenance upon them and gave them peace end of chapter 10 recording by john brandon chapter 11 of nelly channel this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by john brandon nelly channel by sarah dowdney chapter 11 nelly channel the little village seemed to lie asleep in the august sunshine from the upland where she stood nelly could see the columns of pale smoke going up from cottage chimneys but nobody was astir in the gardens it was noon scarcely a flake of cloud relieved the intense blue overhead not a breath of wind fanned the thick leafage in the copse behind her nelly channel was not sorry that the morning was over like most people who have a great deal of time on their hands she was often puzzled about the disposal of it when she had diligently practiced on the piano indoors and had paid a visit to the little stepbrother and sister in the nursery there was nothing more to be done she used sometimes to say that this part of her life was like an isthmus connecting the two continents of schoolgirlhood and womanhood on this morning she carried a book out of doors and had read it from beginning to end it was a book that had been recommended to her by mrs channel nelly had a great reverence for her stepmother's opinion but the story had not pleased her at all it was directly opposed to all her notions of right and wrong she even went so far as to say to herself that it ought never to have been written nelly was a girl who generally spoke her mind a little bluntly sometimes but always with that natural earnestness which makes one forgive the bluntness as the distant church clock struck twelve and the stable clock repeated the strokes she turned and went into the house it was a large handsome house which her father had built soon after his second marriage about twelve years ago but although they had coaxed the creepers to grow over the red bricks and wreathe the doors and windows nelly always maintained that it was not so charming a place as the little vine-covered cottage where she was born the cottage was still standing she could see it from her father's hall door and she had only to cross two fields and an orchard when she wanted to visit the dear old man and woman who had sheltered her in her childhood on the threshold of the house stood mrs channel with a light basket on her arm i'm going to the cottage to see mother she explained i have been making a new cap for her look nelly she lifted the basket lid and afforded nelly a glimpse of soft lace and lilac ribbons why didn't you let me make it mamma the girl asked i think you ought to use these idle hands of mine if you want to keep them out of mischief i gave you a book to read this morning mrs channel replied yes i have read it and i don't like it said candid nelly stepping back to lay the volume on the hall table i will go with you to the cottage and we can talk it over arm in arm they walked through the sweet grass keeping under the shadow of the hedges and trees mrs channel waited for the girl to speak again i don't like the book nelly repeated after a pause the writer seems to have strange ideas the hero a very poor hero is false to the heroine 
after getting engaged to her he discovers that he can never love her as he loves another girl and of course she releases him from the engagement when she finds out the truth but instead of representing him as the worthless fellow that he was the author persists in showing us that he became a good husband and father he begins his career by an act of treachery and yet he prospers and is wonderfully happy with the wife of his choice it is too bad lewis moore was not a treacherous man said mrs channel quietly he made a great and terrible mistake but sometimes it is not easy to distinguish between a blunder and a crime the heroine alice had grace given her to make that distinction she saved him and herself from the effects of the blunder by setting him free she bade him go and marry margaret because she saw that margaret was the only woman who could make him happy he didn't deserve to be happy cried nelly he ought to have been sure of himself before he proposed to alice if i had been in alice's place i would have let him depart but not with a blessing she took it far too tamely i would have let him see that i despised him mrs channel thought within herself that the young often believe themselves a thousand times harder-hearted than they are those who feel the bitterest wrath when they think of an injury that has never come to them are the most patient and merciful when they actually meet it face to face but she did not say this to nelly the book was talked of no more that day and for many a day afterwards it stood neglected on mrs channel's shelves nelly had forgotten it after a night's sleep and the next morning's post brought her a surprise when she entered the breakfast-room her father was already seated at the table looking over his letters he held up one addressed in a legal-looking hand to miss ellen channel who is your new correspondent nelly he asked this is something different from the young ladyish epistles you're in the habit of receiving isn't it i don't know the writing she said opening it carelessly but in the next minute she laid it hastily before him read it father she cried old mr myrtle is dead and has left me three thousand pounds you remember how he made a pet of me in my school days mr channel read the letter in silence and then he looked up quickly into his daughter's face and put his hand on hers i hope no one is defrauded by this legacy he said gravely you will have quite enough without it nelly had mr myrtle any relations he used to say that he was quite alone in the world she answered his house was next to our school and the gardens joined that was how i came to see so much of him no one ever went to stay with him and he seldom had even a caller i wish he had left the money to a poorer girl remarked mr channel well nelly you will now have a hundred and fifty pounds a year to do as you like with i hope you'll spend it wisely my dear it was generally known throughout the county that nelly was the daughter of a rich man she was very pretty too although not so beautiful as her mother had been and at nineteen she was not without would-be suitors and admirers but not one of these was a man after robert channel's own heart they were hunting and sporting country gentlemen who talked of dogs and horses all day long he wanted a man of another stamp for nelly he did not care about long pedigrees nor did he hanker after ancestral lands he desired for his child a husband who would guide a young wife as bravely up the hill of sacrifice as over the plain called ease it might have been that robert channel thought too much of what the husband should be to the wife and too little of what the wife is to the husband there are moments in the life of the strongest men when only the touch of a woman's hand has kept them from turning into a wrong road but it is not easy for a father anxious for the safety of his girl's future to think of anything beyond her requirements nelly was a prize and mr channel could but daily pray that she might not be won by one who was unworthy of her End of chapter 11
Recording by John Brandon. Chapter Twelve of Nelly Chanel. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nancy Gergen, Gilbert, Arizona. Nelly Chanel by Sarah Dudney. Chapter Twelve. Morgan Foster, the new curate. In the golden harvest time just after they had celebrated nelly's nineteenth birthday a new face appeared in heinstein and a new influence began to work among the villagers the rector who had grown old and feeble was at last induced to secure the services of curate and robert chanel having been a good friend to the people for many a day felt almost disposed to look jealously upon the stranger but before a month had passed by Mr. Chanel and the curate had found out that they were of one mind. The newcomer did not want to upset any of the old plans, but he showed himself capable of improving them. He was no shallow boy, inflated with vast notions of his own self-importance, but a thoughtful, active man whose wisdom and experience was far beyond his years. And Robert liked Morgan Foster all the better because he was the son of poor parents and had worked hard all his days, first as a grammar school boy and then as a sizer at cambridge nelly liked his sermons which were never above her comprehension and yet she liked him none the less perhaps because her instincts told her that he could have soared higher if he had chosen she fell into the habit of comparing him with all the men she had ever known and found that he always gained by the process even in person the son of the people could hold his own against the descendants of the old county families he was a tall broad-shouldered man and nelly whose stature was above middle height secretly took up pleasure in feeling that she must look up to him they were seen walking side by side along the hunstein lanes and folks began to say that they were a fine couple those calm autumn days were very sweet days to nelly chanel the summer lingered long no wild wind suddenly stripped the trees and so the woods kept their leafiness and stood in all their gorgeous apparel under the pale blue skies nelly thought it must be the peace of this slow decay and tranquil sunshine that made her life so happy at this time she did not own to herself that every bit of the old scenery had become dearer because morgan foster was learning to love it too her father and mother discovered the secret long before she had found it out and they smiled over it together not ill-pleased she had more than one offer just at this period the neighboring country houses were full of men who had come to hunstein for the shooting they admired nelly running by her father's side and looking vigorous and blooming in her habit and hat they met her now and then at a dinner party and straightway fell in love with her chestnut hair and brown eyes and were not unmindful of the handsome dowry that would go with these charms she was wont to say long afterwards that her unconscious attachment to another was a safeguard of god's providing many a woman speaks the fatal yes because her heart furnishes her with no reason for saying no robert chanel encouraged the curate to come often to his house but no one hinted that he thought of him as a possible son-in-law it was too absurd to suppose that he would give his nelly to a man who had only a hundred and fifty a year and was encumbered with an old father and mother living in obscurity some of the disappointed suitors remarked that chanel was a fool to have the parson hanging about the place there was no counting on the whims of a spoiled beauty who might take it into her head to fling herself away on a curate but this notion was not generally entertained and the intimacy increased without exciting much notice christmas had come and gone it was the last day of the old year nelly sitting alone by the drawing-room fire was seriously taking herself to task and asking her own heart why the world was so very desolate that day true the ground was covered with snow but the afternoon sky was bright with winter sunshine the brown woodlands took rich tinges from the golden rays that slanted over them and scarlet berries glistened against the garden wall 
Nellie had wrapped a shawl round her shoulders and had laid the blame of her low spirits on a cold. But the cold is not to blame, owned the girl to herself. When one has a friend, such a friend as Mr. Foster, one does not like him to stay away from the house for a week, and one cannot bear to hear that he is always at the rectory when Miss White is there. And yet it ought not to matter to me. It mattered so much that the tears in Nellie's brown eyes began to run down her cheeks. At that very moment, the drawing-room door was thrown open, and the page announced Mr. Foster. The curate advanced a few paces and stopped in sudden dismay. There was something so pathetic in Nellie's pale, tearful face that he was stricken speechless for a moment, and then he recovered himself and began to make anxious inquiries which she scarcely knew how to answer nothing has happened mr foster she sobbed i am only crying because i am in low spirits shall i go away now and call to-morrow asked the bewildered young man in his embarrassment no said nelly suddenly looking up through her tears i shall be a great deal worse if you leave me to myself her face told him more than her words in a moment the truth flashed upon him and covered him with confusion a vainer man or one less occupied in earnest work would have seen it far sooner morgan foster took a chair by her side and felt his heart throbbing as it had seldom throbbed before there was but one thing to be done and he was going to do it there is no need to tell what he said perhaps it was not a very impassioned declaration but it made a happy woman of nelly and only a few minutes later mr chanel and his wife returned from a wintry walk and found the two young people together. There were no concealments. Morgan was too honorable and Nelly too simple-hearted to make her seek a secret of what had taken place. It was all talked over quietly, but with a good deal of restrained feeling, and then, having declined an invitation to dinner, the curate went his way. He scarcely knew himself in the character of an engaged man. He had been working so hard all his life that marriage had been a very distant prospect to him. While there were the dear old parents to be helped, how could he think of taking a wife? And now, here was a rich girl, willing to marry him. And here was her father, actually consenting to the match with evident satisfaction. But Nellie was something better than an heiress. She was a very sweet woman, such a woman as any man would have been proud to win so morgan foster as he walked back to his lodging over the frozen snow began to wonder at the good gifts that heaven had showered upon him it was a strange fact that he was more inclined to wonder than to rejoice End of chapter twelve recording by nancy gergen gilbert arizona chapter thirteen of nelly chanel this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nancy Gergen, Gilbert, Arizona. Nellie Chanel by Sarah Dudney, Chapter 13. What a Little Poem Revealed Lovers, like sinners, are nearly always found out, and in a very short time everybody knew that Nellie Chanel was engaged. It is not worth while to record all the remarks that this affair drew forth. There were comments of the usual kind. The curate was called a schemer, and the father was said to have cruelly neglected the interests of his child. But as none of these observations reached the ears of those whom they chiefly concerned, nobody was any the worse for them. Meanwhile, Morgan took his good fortune in a very tranquil way. He saw Nellie nearly every day, and she did most of the talking that went on between them. Her conversation, like herself, was always simple and bright. It did not weary the listener, and yet it sometimes set him wondering at the ease with which she opened her heart and let out her, its innermost thoughts. He was conscious that he had never let her get beyond the vestibule of his inner self, but he would fain have had it otherwise. It pained him, even while it comforted him, to see that she was quite unaware of his involuntary reserve had she known that he kept any locked-up chambers she would have striven to find the keys and would most likely have succeeded 
but she did not know it she possessed no instinct keen enough to tell her that she might live with this man for years without once getting close to his soul read this nelly he said one february afternoon he had called to take her out walking and they were standing together at the drawing-room window all the snow was gone and in its stead there was clusters of snowdrops scattered over the brown mould here and there was a group of golden-eyed polyanthus a little yellow hammer perched on the garden wall piped its small sweet song there was sunlight out of doors and nelly looking bright and picturesque in her velvet and sable was impatient to leave the house morgan had taken a copy of the monthly guest from his pocket and was pointing to a little poem on one of his pages i can read it when we have had our walk nelly answered then catching a slight shade of disappointment on his face she gave her whole attention to the verses at once how pretty she said having conscientiously travelled through the thirty lines how strange it seems that some people should have the power of putting their ideas into rhyme the writer has a nice name eve hazelburn perhaps it is merely a nom de plume replied morgan returning the journal to his pocket nelly thought within herself that she had never found her lover a pleasanter companion than he was that day he amused her with little stories of his college life and even went back to his grammar school days in search of incidents it was a delightful walk twilight was creeping on when they found themselves at the house door again but morgan came no farther than the threshold no thank you he said i cannot dine with you to-night i must go home and write letters good night nelly dear he went his way through the leafless lanes past the cottages and gardens to the old sexton's ivory-covered dwelling then he lifted the latch and went straight to the little parlor that had been given up to his use it was a very small room so low that the beam across the ceiling was blackened and blistered by the heat from the curate's reading lamp six rush-bottomed chairs stood with their backs against the wall and a carpet-covered hassock was the sole pretension to luxury that the apartment contained but a cheerful fire was blazing in the grate and on a little red tray stood a homely black teapot i saw you a comin through the lane sir and i've boiled an egg for you said his good landlady bustling in it's bitter cold still my good man hopes you'll keep your fire up she went back to her own quarters with a troubled look on her kindly old face somehow her lodger did not seem quite so bright as he ought to have been after taking a walk with his sweetheart she thought they must have had a lover's quarrel and womanlike was disposed to lay the blame thereof on her own sex all girls is fond of worritin men higher low rich or poor they're all alike she said to her husband they don't like going on too peaceable nothing pleases em so well as a bit of a tiff now and then but if miss chanel don't know when she's well off she's a foolish body women are a-most as bad as the children of israel a quarrelin with their blessings while the sexton's wife was misjudging poor unconscious nelly the curate sat lingering over his teacup he was thoroughly realizing for the first time that he had made a mistake in asking miss chanel to be his wife it was a little thing that had opened his eyes to the blunder merely her way of reading the little poem in the monthly guest he had been always vaguely hoping that something would bring them nearer together and make it possible for him to give all that he ought to give and he had thought that the poem would do it the verses seemed to have proceeded straight from some human heart whose feelings and aspirations were identical with his own they expressed the same sense of failure and hope which every earnest worker for god must feel they describe the peace which always grows out of hearty effort even if that effort be not a success just one word or look of comprehension would have led him on to speak out of his interior self but poor nelly saw nothing in the poem beyond its rhymes she was like one who misses a diamond in gazing at its setting thank god he said half aloud then i could hide my sense of disappointment from her she shall never know that i want anything but her sweetness and goodness poor child what a happy man i ought to be and yet what an ungrateful wretch i seem in my own eyes he sat looking sadly into the red hollow of the neglected fire and sighed heavily i am like old bunyan's pilgrims he continued 
I remember that they came to a place where they saw a way put itself into their way, and seemed withal to lie as straight as the way which they should go. And now I fear that I have gone out of my right path without knowing it. Well, so long as the penalty falls upon me only, I can bear it. But his spirit was still disquieted when he went to his little chamber that night. He lay awake for hours thinking of Nellie, and of the future which lay before them both. Next morning came a letter in his father's handwriting, which was full of sad tidings. His mother was dangerously ill. Could he not come to her at once? Morgan went straight away to the rectory, and laid his case before the rector. The old man had his son, a young deacon, staying in his house, and readily consented to spare his curate. Then there was a letter to Nelly to be written, explaining the cause of his sudden departure. Before noon the train was bearing him far away from the vales and woods of Hunstein, straight to the great world of London. And from Houston Square he traveled to the ancient Warwickshire city where his parents had made their home. End of chapter 13 Recording by Nancy Gergen, Gilbert, Arizona Chapter 14 of Nellie Chanel. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nancy Gergen, Gilbert, Arizona. Nellie Chanel by Sarah Dudney. Chapter 14 Eve Hazelburn, Poet and Friend. A very humble home it was but his love had stinted self to obtain comforts for them. The light of the February day was fading when he entered the little house and found his father eagerly watching for him. "'You are a good son.' "'A good son,' said the old man in a broken voice. "'She is no worse, and Miss Hazelburn is with her.' "'Hazelburn,' the name had a familiar sound, but Morgan was too weary and agitated to remember where he had heard it before." He took his way at once to his mother's chamber. As he went in, a small, slight figure rose from a chair by the bedside and quietly glided away. He scarcely looked at it in the gathering dusk. Moreover, he had no thoughts, just then, for anybody but the mother who lay there yearning for a sight of him. His coming seemed to do Mrs. Foster good and give her a new hold upon life. It was a low nervous fever that had seized upon her, taking away his strength by slow degrees, until she had grown almost as helpless as an infant. But God had sent her a friend in Eve Hazelburn, and before he slept that night, Morgan had heard from his father's lips the story of Miss Hazelburn's unselfish kindness. Eve was one of those friendless beings who are thrown entirely on their own resources, and often get on better than the more favored children of fortune. She had an easy post as governess in the family of Mr. Gold, a rich Warwickshire merchant, too easy, as she sometimes said, for the little Golds had holiday two or three times a week, and were not on any account to be burdened with long study hours. The house was in a perpetual bustle, visitors constantly coming and going, but if her employers were unjust to themselves, they were far from ungenerous to Eve. They would fain have had her share in all their feastings and merrymakings, and laughed and wondered at her liking for retirement and peace. There had been sickness in their household. Soon after Christmas the whole family had gone away to a sheltered watering place, leaving Miss Hazelburn in charge of the house, and of the two servants who remained in it. She had not made many friends in the city of C. Her Sundays were her own, and her services in the Sunday school had won gratitude and approval from the vicar of the parish. She went occasionally, but not often, to the vicarage. The acquaintance between Morgan's parents and herself was nearly a year old. Their quiet street ran along at the back of the merchant's great house, and Eve had watched the pair sometimes from her chamber window. Then there was a chance meeting, a slight service rendered, and the governess became their friend and frequent visitor. The absence of the Golds left her at liberty to nurse Mrs. Foster in her illness. The servants, being sober and trustworthy, required little watching, and Eve's time was her own. None ever knew what it cost her to give up all her leisure to the sick woman. None guessed that a cherished plan 
was quietly laid aside for Mrs. Foster's sake. The manuscript which she had hoped to complete in these holidays of hers was put by. An inner voice told her that God meant her to use her leisure in another way, and Eve's life was so still, so free from turmoil and passion, that she could always hear the voices that spoke to her soul. Days went and came. The old rector of Anstein wrote kindly to his curate, bidding him stay in Warwickshire as long as his mother needed him. Nelly wrote, too, such simple, loving letters that every word went like a stab to Morgan's heart. She also begged him not to hasten his return for her sake. It was good for her, her father told her, to have this slight dash of bitterness in a cup that had been oversweet, and poor Nelly made so great a show of heroism over this little trial of hers that those of her own household smiled. Meanwhile, even Morgan met every day, and he talked to her about her poem, which was the only production of hers that had as yet found its way into print. The poem was the starting point from which they traveled on into each other's experiences. Ah, how easily and quickly people glide into familiar intercourse when there is a spiritual kinship between them. Poor Morgan's heart opened to Eve as naturally as a flower uncloses to the sun. Yet he never suspected that this was the beginning of love. The curate had not told his parents of his engagement. He had been morbidly afraid that it would put a sense of distance between the old people and himself. Therefore he had said nothing about it in his letters, but had waited till he should see them face to face. But now that the time had come, he feared to make the disclosure. His mother was in no condition to bear any startling news. And as to Miss Hazelburn, of what consequence could his affairs be to her? So the intimacy went on. He was too blind to see the injustice that he was doing Nelly and Eve herself. "'We are really not very new friends,' he said to the governess one day. "'I knew you through your poem. We met in the spirit before we met in the flesh.' "'Nobody need be solitary nowadays,' answered Eve, brightly. "'I have many such spiritual friends whom I shall probably never see with my bodily eyes. Don't you think that one of the joys of eternity will be in finding out what we have done for each other unconsciously?' I am often unspeakably grateful for the printed words that have helped me on. Do you find many companions in Mr. Golds's house? he asked. No, she said frankly. You know what it is to like people, and yet have no affinity with them. The Golds's life is a perpetual pleasure hunt. Parents and children join in the chase from morning till night. There is little rest or stillness in the house. I should be scarcely sorry to leave it. "'Are you thinking of leaving it?' Morgan inquired. "'Not yet. Indeed, I have no other home,' she answered. "'I had a hope last year that one might be provided for me, but that is over now.' They were sitting together in the Foster's little parlor while this talk went on. It was Sunday afternoon. Mrs. Foster, now steadily making progress towards recovery, was asleep upstairs, and her husband had ventured out to church. The sun was getting low, a yellow light came stealing over the roofs of the opposite houses and shone full upon eve's face her last words had been spoken in a sad tone her eyes looked dreamily out into the narrow street she was very far from realizing the interpretation that morgan had put upon her remark nor did she dream of the sudden turmoil that was working within him as he sat watching her face she was not a pretty woman she had the charms that belonged to symmetry of form and grace of manner and movement, but few of those who were struck at once by Nellie Chanel's beauty would have noticed Eve. They would have failed to see the noble shape of that small head and the play of light and shade on the careworn young face. Yet as Morgan sat watching her, he was stung by the sharpness of jealous agony. Had some man wooed this girl and been an accepted lover? He could not endure the idea that those chance words of hers had conjured up. The grand passion of his life was revealed to him in a moment. He knew what he felt towards Eve, and knew, too, that this was what he ought to have felt towards another. This was love. It was but a poor counterfeit thereof that he had given to Nellie. Some people think nothing of breaking a promise, she continued, still looking out into the street. Years ago, when I was a child, and my father was a prosperous man, his friend Mr. Myrtle came to him in sore need of money. 
my father lent him three thousand pounds the sum was lent without security and it was never repaid morgan breathed more freely but he thought of nelly's legacy when my father felt himself to be dying he went on he wrote to mr myrtle reminding him once more of the debt it was for my sake that he did this knowing that i should be left quite friendless and almost penniless and mr myrtle promised to leave me three thousand pounds in his will he died last year mr foster but there was no legacy for me morgan's words of sympathy sounded flat and commonplace he was too much overcome with shame to be conscious of what he was saying it was almost a relief when his old father returned from church and broke up the tete-a-tete -tete. when mrs foster was well enough to move from her bed to a couch the curate bethought him of returning to hunt's dean he did not dare to think much of all that awaited him there he had lived a lifetime in the space of a few weeks and the village and its associations looked unreal and far away at this time shame was his dominant feeling he forgot to pity himself for the blunder that he had made he thought only of his involuntary treachery he did not dream of making any confession to nelly she should be no sufferer through this dreadful mistake of his and he wrote her as lover-like a letter as he could frame telling her that he was coming home in a few days End of chapter fourteen Recording by Nancy Gergen, Gilbert, Arizona. Chapter 15 of Nellie Chanel. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nancy Gergen, Gilbert, Arizona. Nellie Chanel by Sarah Dudney chapter fifteen a confession overheard it was the afternoon of morgan's last day in warwickshire he sat by his mother's couch holding her thin hand in his and wishing with all his heart that she were the only woman in the world who had any claim upon him she looked at him with a long earnest look once or twice her lips opened but some moments went by before she spoke they were alone mr foster had pattered off to the railway station to seek information about the train by which morgan was to travel as he sat there with the dear old woman who had shared all his early joys and sorrows he could not help longing to tell her of his new trouble but he knew not how to begin and then her gentle voice broke the silence morgan she said maybe i am going to do a foolish thing i never was a matchmaker for I've always thought that God alone ought to bring people together. But when I see two who seem to be made for each other, and one of them so near to me, how can I help saying a word? Speak on, mother, he answered, drawing a long breath. He knew what was coming. Well, at any rate, it would give him the opportunity of unburdening his heart. I should like to see you engaged to Eve Hazelburn, she continued, gaining courage. She is as good as a daughter to me but that isn't the reason that I want her for my son's wife. I want her because there's a sort of likeness between you that makes me sure you ought to be made one. And I've seen your eyes follow her, Morgan, as if you thought so too. It cannot be, mother, said the curate, almost passionately. It cannot be, and yet I know it ought to be. I am already engaged to another woman, but I love Eve Hazelburn as I shall never love again god help us all sighed mrs foster suddenly pressing his hand to enjoin silence it was too late his voice had been raised above its usual tone and there stood eve at the open door he did not care he was almost glad that she knew all there had come upon him the recklessness that often arises out of hopelessness if he must wear his chain she should know what a heavy weight it was come in miss hazelburn he said rising excitedly i am not sorry that you have overheard me perhaps you will pity me a little surely you can spare a grain of compassion for the poor fool who has spoiled his own life i think you will for you are a good woman some women would glory in conquest of this sort but you are not of that number ah i am talking nonsense i suppose eve went straight up to him and laid her hand upon his arm 
she could not pretend to have heard nothing or she would not have told a lie if she could have her light touch stopped him in his impatient walk up and down the little room think of your mother mr foster she said softly she is not strong enough to bear a scene he sat down again by the couch and buried his face in the cushion on which mrs foster's head rested it was a boyish action but eve knew that the best men in the world generally keep a touch of boyishness about them her heart ached for him as she stood looking down upon the bowed head and then the mother's glance met hers and both women began to weep silently i'm a foolish old body said poor mrs foster it is a mistake to go knocking at the door of any heart even if it's that of one's child i have better have held my tongue and left all to god it is better as it is morgan answered rising his head and speaking more quietly i am less miserable than i was before and miss hazelburn will understand he added with a little pride that although i am an unhappy man i don't mean to be a traitor i do not wish to recall anything i have said every word was true and now that she knows all she will pray for me eve stood before him and held out her hand i am going now she said god bless you mr foster you shall have all the blessings that my prayers can win for you and the truest respect and friendship that a woman can give perhaps we shall never meet again if we do i think this scene will seem like a dream to us both she went her way out of the shabby little house into the narrow street had god nothing better to give her than this had he shown her the beautiful land of might have been only to send her back doubly desolate into the wilderness these were the first rebellious questions that arose in eve's heart and it was some time before they were answered early on the following morning she went to the window of her room and looked between the slats of the venetian blind it was chill and gray out of doors the sun had not yet fully risen and only a faint pallor was to be seen in the eastern sky presently a fly stopped at the door of that shabby little house which she knew so well then the flyman knocked the door opened and he entered soon reappearing with a portmanteau another figure followed tall and black coated at the sight of it poor eve uttered a low cry and pressed her hands tightly together a moment more and the fly had rattled off down the street and had turned the corner on its way to the railway station was that to be the end of it all shivering and forlorn she went back to her bed and lay there for a time mutely praying for strength and peace afterwards she knew all that morgan's mother could tell her about his engagement and she knew too that nelly chanel was the lady to whom mr myrtle had left the three thousand pounds it seemed to her just then poor girl as if nelly were taking all the things that ought to have been hers but this mood did not last long and she was sorry that such bitter thoughts should have found their way into her heart the gulls came back from the seaside early in march and the ordinary way of life began again morgan too had gone back to his work but it was harder for him than for eve she had no part to sustain no love to stimulate and she had the consolation of her mother's friendship and the sad delight of reading his letters in those letters no mention was ever made of her but they told of a life of daily struggles a life whose best comfort was found in labor eve and mrs foster wept over them together and clung to each other with a new tenderness the mother had faith and she believed that her son would be set free she ventured once or twice to say this to eve but the girl shook her head no she said we must not look for that we ought rather to pray that the ties may grow pleasant instead of irksome i don't know replied mrs foster thoughtfully i almost think it is best to pray for the freedom it was not the right kind of feeling eve that led him to propose to miss chanel he was startled into it and it was really seemed at first as if that were the way that god meant him to go he should have stood still and just have waited for guidance eve remarked sadly yes i know that admitted the mother but do not most of our troubles come to us because we will not wait we all find it easier to run than to stand still 
while these other hearts were throbbing with restless pain nelly chanel was serenely happy she complained at times that morgan was working too hard and wearing himself out but she never thought of attributing his wane looks to any cause save that of overexertion. but robert chanel had a keener sight and he began to ask himself uneasily if he had been right in letting this engagement come to pass in his heart of hearts he owned that he had been secretly anxious to secure the curate for his daughter it was the desire of his life that nelly should marry a good man and morgan foster was the best man that had as yet come in her way perhaps he too had been running when he ought to have stood still he began to think that this was the case but how could he undo what was done in his perplexity he talked the matter over with his wife and she admitted that the curate did not seem to be quite at ease in nelly's company there was a shadow upon him it might be a consciousness of failing health or or of falling in love said mrs chanel finishing her sentence if that is it rhoda it is the miserable affair indeed we ought to have made them wait before we sanctioned the engagement but you know i wanted to keep her safe from these selfish worldly men who have been seeking her we are always afraid to trust god with anything dear to us answered mrs chanel sadly but if morgan foster has mistaken his own feelings robert it will be hard to condemn him and equally hard to forgive him summer came and early in july all the gossips in hunstein were talking of the rich family who had taken laurel house mr gold they said was a retired merchant from warwickshire who was as wealthy as a nabob his household consisted of a wife and six children a governess and manservants and maidservants and when nelly heard that the governess was a miss hazelburn the name awoke no recollections she had quite forgotten the little poem in the monthly guest the chanels called on the newcomers and were received by miss hazelburn illness kept mrs gold in her own room for some weeks after her arrival in hunstein and on eve devolved the unwelcome task of seeing visitors the one whom she most dreaded and most longed to see did not come she saw him in church and that was all she had determined that her stay in hunstein should be as short as possible already she was answering advertisements and doing her utmost to get away from the place it was hard upon her she thought that among the earliest callers should be nelly chanel yet when she saw the girl she felt a thrill of secret satisfaction this then was the one before whom she was preferred and eve's eyes told her that she could no more be compared with nelly than a daisy can be compared with a rose but the poor daisy growing in life's highway unsheltered from the storm of the world was left better than the beautiful garden flower she was human and she could not help but rejoicing in her unsuspected triumph. Nellie took a girl's sudden and unreasonable liking to the governess. She wanted Miss Hazelburn to be her friend. She talked of her to everybody, including Morgan Foster. "'Have you seen her, Morgan?' she asked. "'I have seen her in church,' he answered. "'Then you haven't called on the golds yet,' said Nellie. "'Why don't you go there?' "'The rector has called,' Morgan replied." and there really is no need for a curate to be thrusting himself into rich folks' homes unless they are ill. "'You didn't mind coming in our house,' rejoined Nellie, "'and I dare say we are as rich as the golds. "'But you can't judge of Miss Hazelburn by seeing her in church, Morgan. "'It is in conversation that you find out how charming she is. "'And actually there is something in her that reminds me of you. "'I can't tell where the resemblance lies.' it may be in the voice or it may be in the face but i am certain that it exists it exists only in your imagination said morgan bent upon changing the subject before mrs gould had entirely recovered nelly had got into a habit of running in and out of the house it was about three-quarters of a mile from her home and stood on the summit of the green downs which she had loved in her childhood the garden slanted down from the back of the house to these open downs it was raised above the slopes and terminated in a gravel terrace and so low was this terrace that nelly could easily climb upon it and go straying into the shrubbery she had done this dozens of times while laurel house was empty 
for the old garden with its thick hedges of laurel and yew had always been a favorite haunt of hers finding that the golds were free and easy people who gladly welcomed the pretty trespasser she chose to keep up her old custom end of chapter fifteen recording by nancy gergen gilbert arizona chapter sixteen of nelly chanel this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by nancy gergen gilbert arizona nelly chanel by sarah dudney chapter sixteen how the truth came out one august evening when it was too sultry to stay indoors nelly wandered out into the lanes alone she had told morgan that she was going to drive into the nearest town on a shopping expedition and should not return till dusk but one of her ponies had fallen lame and she had given up the plan on she went saying a kind word or two to the villagers as she passed their cottages they all loved nelly well her bright face came amongst them like a sunbeam even the smallest children had a smile for her as she went by she was so young and healthy and beautiful that many an admiring glance followed her tall figure she belonged to hunstein and hunstein was proud of her she made straight for the downs tripping up the green slopes and startling the browsing sheep she gave a friendly nod to the little shepherd boy who lay idly stretched upon the grass and then as she had done often enough before she mounted the gravel terrace and sat down on the rustic bench behind the hedge of laurels from this spot she could not see laurel house at all the high wall of evergreens completely shut in the view of the residence and its gardens the gravel terrace was divided from the grounds by this thick hedge and was only approached from the house by one long straight path of turf the path terminated in an arch formed by the carefully kept shrubs and giving access to the platform and any one walking on the downs must go up to the middle of the terrace and look through this archway before he could get a glimpse of the house nelly knew that miss hazelburn liked to walk up and down the turfy path when the day's duties were done she meant to rest herself for a few minutes before entering the gardens the bench was at the very end of the platform she loved the seat because it commanded an extensive view of the surrounding country beyond the hunstein downs she could see other hills lying far away softly outlined against the summer evening sky and nearer lay the dear old meadows and homesteads and the long tracts of woodland all familiar and beloved scenes to the girl who had been born and bred among them the air was very still even here it was but a faint breath of wind that fanned her flushed cheeks but the coolness of these highlands was delightful after the closeness of the vale she sat and enjoyed it in silence quite suddenly the sound of voices broke the stillness the speakers were hidden from Nellie's gaze, for the tones came from the other side of the laurel hedge. Eve Hazelburn's accents, clear and musical, could be recognized in a moment. "'I'm going away next week,' she said, going back to Warwickshire. "'Mr. Foster, I wrote to Mr. Lindley and the good vicar of the sea, and he has found a place for me. I am to be companion to an invalid lady whose house is close to the street where your father and mother live.' they will be glad to have me near them again she spoke rapidly and a little louder than usual nelly overwhelmed with astonishment sat still without giving a thought to her position as an eavesdropper i have kept away from you i have tried not to think of you cried morgan foster in irrepressible anguish god does not help me in this matter i have prayed worked struggled yet i got no relief what shall i do what shall i do you must endure to the end she answered with a little sob god will make it easier by and by oh i am so sorry to come here mr foster but i could not help it we will never meet again you and i yet i am glad that i know miss chanel i will go and tell the old people what a sweet bright girl she is and they will soon learn to love her it will all come right in the end ah if i could believe that said the curate but i can't it is madness to think that a wrong path can have a right ending 
sometimes i am persuaded it would be best to tell her everything if you did cried eve sternly you would break her heart and don't think pray don't think mr foster that i would build my house on the ruins of another woman's happiness when i am gone and the proud voice trembled you will learn to submit to circumstances we are not likely to cross each other's paths again you will be a rich man oh the money makes it all the harder to bear interrupted morgan bitterly that three thousand pounds that mr myrtle promised to leave to you has been left to her did you know this nelly did not wait to hear eve's reply swiftly and noiselessly she sprang from the terrace onto the smooth sod beneath her muslin dress making no rustle as she moved away she sped down the green slopes the sheep parted to the left and right before her flying footsteps the shepherd lad stared after her in amazement she did not take the road that led through the village in her misery and bewilderment she remembered that she could not bear the friendly good nights of the cottagers she struck wildly across the fields regardless of the wet grass and the brambles that tore her thin skirts as she dashed through the gaps in the hedges until she came to the side of the brook where she was alone in her grief she was not thinking at all she was only feeling feeling passionately and bitterly that she had been cruelly wronged and deceived oh those two she moaned aloud as her home came in sight the man whom i loved the girl whom i would have made my friend robert chanel and his wife were sitting together in the library he had been reading aloud shakespeare still lay open on his knee and rhoda occupied a low chair by his side they were talking as happy married people love to talk of the old days when god first brought them together while they chatted in low tones the day was fast closing in the french doors stood open and the first breath of the night wind stole into the room a dusky golden haze was settling down over the garden the air was heavy with flower scents and the faint odors of fallen leaves suddenly a great shower of petals from overblown roses drifted through the casement and nelly swept in after them she sank down on her knees shivering in her limp wet dress and hid her face in her stepmother's lap and then the story was told from beginning to end an hour later rhoda was sitting by nelly's pillow talking to her in the sweet hush of the august twilight already the heat of anger had passed away the girl's thoughts had gone back as rhoda knew they would to that winter afternoon when morgan had asked her to become engaged to him mamma she said piteously he has never loved me at all he gave me all he could give but it was only the silver not the gold it is very very humiliating but it is the truth and it must be faced to-night when i heard him speaking to eve hazelburn i understood the difference between love and liking he liked me and perhaps he saw more than i meant him to see oh mamma i was very young and foolish it touched rhoda to hear nelly speak of her old self in the past tense yet it was a fact the youth and the folly had had their day nelly would never be so young again for sorrow takes away childhood when it teaches wisdom i heard he say she went on that she would never build her house on the ruins of another woman's happiness and god forbid that i should build mine on ground that has never rightfully belonged to me but i wish he had told me the truth he has done me a greater wrong in hiding it than in speaking it out nelly said her stepmother tenderly we believe that morgan has been a blunderer but not a traitor we have blundered terribly ourselves we ought not to have let the engagement take place until we had tested the strength of his attachment we wanted to guard you from unworthy suitors and in taking you out of danger we led you into sorrow i was very foolish repeated nelly with a sigh don't forget rhoda continued that god can bless those whom he puts asunder as well as those whom he joins together it is better to dwell apart than to live together with divided souls he saw we were too weak and stupid to set our mistake right and he has done it for us while we were gazing helplessly at the knot he cut the thread it was on a saturday evening that nelly's love affair came to an end she was in her place in church on sunday morning and during the rest of the day she kept much by her father's side 
they had talked the matter over and over and had arranged all their plans before the night closed in and nelly thanked god that the anger had gone away from her heart although the sorrow remained end of chapter sixteen recording by nancy gergen gilbert arizona Chapter 17 of Nelly Chanel. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nancy Gergen, Gilbert, Arizona. Nelly Chanel by Sarah Dudney. Chapter 17 An Unlooked for Release. Very early on Monday, the Golds' governess took her departure from Huntsdean. The train bore her away through the pleasant southern counties while the dew was still shining in the meadows. On and on it went, past cottages, standing amid fruit-laden trees, and gardens where Michaelmas daisies were in bloom, past yellow fields where the corn was falling under the sickles of the reapers. Hedges were gay with canterbury bells and ragged robins, here and there were dashes of gold on the deep green of the meadows. Eve Hazelburn, quiet and tearless, looked out upon the smiling country and bade it a mute farewell. Afterwards, two carriages laden with luggage drove out of the village, taking the road that led to the neighboring seaport town. The first contained the two little Chanel's and their nurses. In the second sat Rhoda and Nellie, and before the vehicles were out of sight, Robert Chanel had turned his steps in the direction of the curate's lodging. He met the young man in the lane outside the sexton's cottage and gave him a kindly good morning. I am the bearer of startling news, Morgan, he said, slipping a little note into his hand. Let us come under the shade of the churchyard tree. And now, Morgan, before you read the note, I want to ask you to forgive my Nellie. Forgive Nellie, stammered the curate, thinking that if all could be known, it would be Nellie's part to forgive him. Yes, the father answered. Try to think of her as a dear, foolish child who has made a grave mistake. She has sent me to break off her engagement with you, Morgan. She begs you, through me, to forgive her for any pain that she may cause you. She wants you to remember her kindly always but neither to write to her nor seek to see her again. The curate was silent for some moments. No suspicion of the truth crossed his mind. He concluded, not unnaturally, that he had been too quiet and grave a lover for the bright girl. That was all. When he spoke, his words were very few. Perhaps Nellie's father respected him none the less because he made no pretense of great sorrow. His face was pale, and his voice trembled a little, as he said quietly, If you will come into my lodging, Mr. Chanel, I will give you Nellie's letters and her portrait. She may like to have them back again without delay. They walked out of the churchyard and down the lane to the sexton's cottage, and then Morgan left Mr. Chanel sitting in the little parlor while he went upstairs to his room. The hour of release had come. He took out a plain gold locket, which had always been worn unseen, and detached it from its guard. He opened it, and looked long and sadly at the fair face that it contained. It was a delicately painted photograph, true to life, and locket and portrait had been Nellie's first gift. The smile was her own smile, frank and bright. The brown eyes seemed to look straight at the gazer. "'Oh, Nellie,' he said, kissing the picture, "'why couldn't I love you better?' thank god for this painless parting no wonder that you wearied of me dear you will be a thousand times freer and happier without me presently he came downstairs and entered the parlor with the locket and a little packet of letters these he gave silently into mr chanel's hands morgan said robert chanel i am hardly sorry for this don't think that i shall cease to feel for you as a friend because i cannot have you for a son-in-law I shall never forget all your kindness, Morgan answered, in a low voice, but I shall soon leave this place, Mr. Chanel. Better so, perhaps, Robert responded. You ought to labor in a larger sphere. You have great capacities for hard work, Morgan. Then the two men parted with a close hand shake, 
and mr chanel looked back to say almost carelessly my family have migrated to south sea for a month or two i will follow them to-morrow it would be too much to say that the curate regained his freedom with a sigh yet certain it is that this unlooked-for release set his heart aching it might be that his amour propre was slightly wounded for was it not a little hard to find that the girl for whom he had been making a martyr of himself could do very well without him he had climbed the height of self-sacrifice only to find deliverance the spirit of sacrifice had been required of him but the crowning act was not demanded he read nelly's note again it was a very commonplace little letter written in a sloping feminine hand she used that stereotyped phrase which hackneyed as it is does as well or better than any other i feel we are not suited for each other this was the sole excuse offered for breaking the engagement and surely it was excuse enough how could he know that these few trite sentences had been written in the anguish of a woman's first great sorrow we don't recognize the majesty of woe when it masquerades in everyday garments it needs a divine sight to find out the real heroes and heroines of life if morgan had been questioned about nelly the term heroine would have been the very last that he would have applied to her and yet nelly quite unconsciously had acted in the true spirit of heroism by and by the sense of relief began to make itself felt and morgan's heart grew wonderfully light he went through his usual routine of duties and then took his way to the rectory he must give the rector timely notice of his intention to resign his curacy meanwhile robert chanel had proceeded to laurel house mrs gold received him in a depressed manner her governess she said had left her and she seemed to consider that miss hazelburn had used her unkindly she did not know how such a useful person could be replaced nobody would ever satisfy her so well as miss hazelburn had done yes she could give the governess's address to mr chanel she had chosen to go to warwickshire to live with an invalid lady mrs gold hoped she would find the post unbearably dull and would return to her former situation there is little probability of that thought robert chanel as he went his way with the address in his pocket-book and then he thought of Nellie's face and voice when she had stated her intention of giving up Mr. Myrtle's legacy to Eve. I won't keep anything that isn't fairly mine, she had said. Let her have both the lover and the money. Eve never ceased to wonder how the Chanel's had found out that Mr. Myrtle had owed her father three thousand pounds. October had just set in when Eve and Morgan met again. It was Sunday morning, and she was on her way to that beautiful old church which is the chief glory of the city of C. The bells were chiming, the Asian street was bright with autumn light, far above them rose the tall spire, rising high into the calm skies. They said very little to each other at that moment. A great deal had already been set on paper, and they could afford to be quiet just then. Together they entered the church, a happy pair of worshippers, singing and making melody in their hearts to the Lord. A thousand times happier, he remarked afterwards, than we could ever have dared to be if another had suffered for our joy. End of chapter 17 Recording by Nancy Gergen, Gilbert, Arizona Nellie Chanel by Sarah Dudney Chapter 18 of Nellie Chanel This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nancy Gergen, Gilbert, Arizona. Nellie Chanel by Sarah Dudney, Chapter 18. What God Hath Joined Together About two years ago, a great crowd assembled in one of the largest churches in London to hear a popular preacher. He had, it was said, a rare power of touching men's hearts, and of lifting their thoughts out of the mire and clay of this working-day world. And often, too, his wife's name was coupled with his, 
for she, by her written words, was doing angel's work among the people. Fashionable society knew them only as preacher and writer, but some of the unfashionable were better acquainted with them. In the crowd were two persons who managed to get good seats in the middle aisle. They were husband and wife, he a brave soldier, she a beautiful woman. It would not have been easy to have found a couple better matched, or better satisfied with each other. They exchanged a quick glance of intelligence when the preacher ascended the pulpit stairs, and then composed themselves to listen. They were not disappointed in him. As they listened, they understood how and why he won such a ready hearing. And when the sermon was over, Nelly turned to her husband again with the old, bright look, and he answered her with a slight nod of satisfaction. Then, and not till then, did she perceive a familiar face at the top of the pew. As Nelly looked once more on Eve, there was revealed to her a strange glimpse of what might have been if those two had been kept apart, and she had taken Eve's place. She saw herself a restless, unsatisfied wife, always craving for a vague something that was withheld. She saw Morgan crippled, not helped, by her riches, a good man still, but one who had, somehow, missed his footing and failed to climb so high as had been expected of him. And she comprehended, fully and thankfully, the great love and pity of that being who had saved them from their mistake. There was a quiet hand clasp in the crowded aisle, and then these two women went their respective ways and a voice seemed to be ringing in Nellie's ears as she leaned upon her husband's arm. "'I am thinking,' she said, "'of something that was spoken long ago. "'It was when I was in great trouble, dear, "'and felt as if I couldn't be comforted. "'Don't forget,' my stepmother said to me, "'that God can bless those whom he puts asunder "'as well as those whom he joins together. "'And I think I am realizing the truth of those words tonight.'" End of chapter 18. Recording by Nancy Gergen, Gilbert, Arizona. End of Nellie Chanel by Sarah Dudney.